Welcome again to Decode. This is the podcast where we talk all things headless WordPress and modern web development. And we're back with another episode for you. Um, this episode is a bit of a sad one because we're saying goodbye to one of our regulars on the podcast, and that is Will Johnston. Um, Will has, uh, is leaving WP Engine for another opportunity. Um, so we just want to say, you know, Will, thank you so much for all you've contributed to you know, all the work that we do at WP Engine, but in particular, this podcast, all the episodes that you've uh, been on with us. Uh, we appreciate all your time and wish you best of luck in, um, in your next role. Yeah, it's bittersweet. I've, uh, I've really enjoyed this podcast and, and developing it over uh, the past year. Um, that's, it's something I'm certainly going to miss and I'll have to figure out uh, how to fill that void when I, when I move on. Yeah. <laughs> Well, it's always there for you to, to listen to hear your, your old friends, right? So, so definitely tune in. Um, with this episode, uh, because Will is, is taking off for another opportunity, uh, we thought it would be cool to do a bit of a retrospective. Um, Will is somebody who has worked in the software engineering space for years and years and has a lot of experience, um, particularly in, in recent history in the modern JavaScript and TypeScript and NPM ecosystem you know, from the front end uh, development ecosystem, uh, particularly strong in that area, um, but hadn't worked with WordPress uh, in in any capacity other than, I, th I think you mentioned, Will, years and years ago, right? Was it nine or 10 years ago, just as a user, you know, using WordPress um, as a, a CMS, but not really doing software development with it at that time. So we yeah. thought it would be cool in this episode to do a bit of a retrospective and, and ask Will, like, what was your uh, impression of, you know, Word, WordPress as this, this open source CMS everyone's heard of if you're in the web space, just because it's so um, popular at this point. Um, what did you, you know, think about it and what, uh, which of those impressions turned out to be true or false as you, you know, dove into working with it more? And also, what are your thoughts on working with WordPress as a headless CMS? How does it compare to, with other options that are out there? Um, and what are your predict predictions for the future? Will that, you know, way of working with WordPress become more prevalent and what changes would need to take place for that to happen, you know, based on what you've, uh, you've seen. So, uh, I'm excited for this one. I think it'll be cool to hear, um, Will's thoughts and, uh, and see where the conversation leads us. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so with that, let's, um, dive in here. Will, we'd love to hear a bit of a bit of background. Can you just tell the folks listening, um, what your experience with WordPress was uh, before coming to WP Engine and, you know, impressions you had of it as a piece of software. Yeah. And we have a, a specific podcast dedicated to my introduction that you can go listen to to get, listen to, to get an extended background. But, uh, but yeah, I have a pretty extensive background in, in web and application development. Uh, not a ton in, until the past year around WordPress. I've, I've built... Um, some WordPress sites for personal use in the past. Uh, I think I've built one site professionally, like, you know, 10 years ago or so, like you said. Um, so a lot of my thoughts on WordPress uh, prior to joining WP Engine were based on my view of WordPress years ago when I used it. And it's obviously come a long way since then. Yep. Yeah. And, and that's always tough, right? When a technology changes over time and the thing that it is now isn't what it was, you know, previously, um, it can be confusing, right? Cause w WordPress, as we've yeah. mentioned before on the podcast, when WordPress first came out, uh, pages didn't even exist. All there yeah, was, I, I was, was using it around that time, I think. Yeah. Is that all right? Yeah. So all there was um, around that time was the concept of a blog post and then also archive pages, which were just listing every blog posts. You could slice that a few different ways. It'd be an archive post just based on the latest or an archive based on a certain author or a certain, you know, date archive, like, you know, the month of November posts from that yep. month or that kind of thing. And that was really it. And then WordPress, you know, changed uh, to, to support pages uh, and then changed again to support custom post types. And from there, you know, just this, this explosion of the plugin ecosystem happened and people started bolting on tons of the e-commerce solutions or whatever. So, mm -hmm. um, so yeah, what it was back then is, is, you know, definitely a far cry from, from what it is now. So with those impressions that you had, like what turned out to be 
you know, true or false? Uh, so the one thing that I that was pretty certain long ago was that WordPress focused a lot on, um, you know, the publishing experience and 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 publishing in general, uh, and that's still the case today. I think you know since its inception, WordPress has been really focused on publishers, uh, and that you know that's been the constant. Uh, a lot of things that. Uh, you brought up like custom post types, right? Those those were huge when they came out with uh, with WordPress. But I think the WordPress community adopted custom post types, understood them, and and started using them outside of WordPress. Many people uh, don't even know what that means. Uh, so something that I have noticed over the past year or so uh, is that. There are a lot of things that WordPress does that from an outsider looking in, you may not have any idea that it can do more than just, you know, simple blogs and maybe a little light e-commerce and things. I mean, people are using WordPress for to build huge sites now. Mm -hmm. And um, on that note, let's talk about CMSs. Uh, so so WordPress is, is one, you know, the most popular um platform uh, it's fueled in large part because it's free and open source and just the mm -hmm. you know friction involved with getting started with it is so darn low anyone can you know can try out um wordpress and get and get rolling with it um but what other experiences like have you had with content management systems other than wordpress yeah i uh i've used drupal before a little bit i've built a site with drupal uh probably around 2012 so you know around that same time frame about 10 years ago and uh I have also I built my own CMS uh for use for an agency and uh I've also used you know loosely related content management systems like SharePoint and and things like that so when you um so that's impressive first off that you built a CMS I I've met folks who who said yeah I thought I thought it would be cool to have you know to be able to customize the CMS just to what I need. But then I realized how much work that is and how much support is involved. And yeah, I found another open source project that I jumped over to. So, so it's cool that you it's, have that experience. Yeah. It's definitely not for the faint of heart, but, uh, it was really interesting to build it and it, and as with any software platform that you're, you know, trying to, I built it for an agency to use, to build other sites. And um, it, it, it's a constant battle against, uh, you know, you wanting to add features to the CMS, but also having a goal in mind for the types of sites that you want the CMS to build. I think if you approach building your own CMS, it's, it's still possible to do it today. And, um, but if you, if you try to approach building your own CMS to replace something like WordPress, then you're going to have a really difficult time because WordPress has matured over a number of years and it supports tons of different use cases. And uh, it's just not something you can very quickly replicate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, certainly. Um, and uh, on that note, like, so these other CMSs that you had worked with, so Drupal, as well as your, you know, custom built ones, um, did they, those use a monolithic architecture where the CMS would handle, you know, the user admin area and saving data to the database, but also um, serve the HTML to the end users? Or would you, were you early on this train of, you know, decoupling those and doing what is now referred to commonly as like the Jamstack or decoupled architecture? Yeah, I, I'll, I'll also say I've used, you know, Jamstack before in, in the form of just markdown files existing out on a CDN. Um, with Drupal, Drupal was a more traditional monolithic uh, CMS at, around the time I was using it. So that was, it was basically just a WordPress competitor. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know much about what Drupal is today, but back then I did not do it because I wanted to. <laughs> yeah. I was taking, I was kind of taking over a site that was written in Drupal. So, um, so yeah, so that's nothing to say it's not a little bit better today, but I, I don't know much about that. 
Uh, when I built my own CMS, it was a decoupled CMS. So I had a, um, there were a number of parts to it. The, as an agency, the goal was to be able to uh, sort of build a certain subset of websites very quickly. Uh, so we had an admin panel that was multi-tenant. We could go in and add new sites uh, similar to like a multi-site setup with WordPress, uh, only we could, you know, and then we could delegate access to the users of the businesses uh, for whom we built the sites. In there, they could access all of their mo data models and um, they could edit posts and things like that. It was a Markdown-based editor uh, that we built some tooling around to make it a little bit easier for the the layman to edit posts. Sure. Um, and then we also, all of your front ends were decoupled. So we had a separate uh, hosting for front ends and, um, and you could deploy the front ends through the CMS admin panel, but the, uh, the front ends were hosted on separate domains. I see. So why did you choose that then? Why not choose you know, a uh, uh, monolithic CMS where it would hand handle rendering the markup? Uh, it's interesting. We we probably could have gone that route to, to do monolithic CMSs, uh, but we were very focused on building sites cheaply and quickly. So, you know, some of our target customers were uh, mom and pop shops or or restaurants or things that just needed sites very very cheaply, but we wanted to bring mm. rich experiences uh, to them. So uh, rich front end experiences and and sites that felt more, you know, like a a full fledged website and not just a WordPress template. Um, so that's the direction we took, and we could we could put up a site in roughly you know one to two weeks from idea to design to development cool very nice um so you would you say you prefer that approach then like today if you're looking for a cms to use um would you steer clear of those that are have a monolithic you know architecture for projects you're involved with uh i think it depends so okay. you know i still think that if you on a limited budget there's nothing easier than spinning up a traditional uh, monolithic WordPress site. I mean, it's very simple. You can go to a host and, you know, you buy the domain and you spin the site up uh, within a couple hours, right? And choose yeah. your template and, and go from there and then customize it as you go uh, and, and, and you, as you see fit. So I think on a limited budget, it's very much worth it. And mm. I also think past that point it really depends on the team right if you have a if you're you know familiar with php development or you have a lot of developers or you have friends or you work with an agency that does a lot of php and traditional wordpress development then that it totally makes sense to stay in that world i mean you can scale traditional wordpress uh pretty easily certainly enough uh to be okay with with for most businesses um, for me personally, in my, you know, my personal life, <laughs> I love right. headless and that's why I, you know, we started this podcast. We talk about headless, the developer relations team at WP engine is all about headless. Mm -hmm. Uh, the future for me is in headless development for sure. And headless yeah. WordPress development. Yeah. So tell us a bit about, um, how you think WordPress, what, what you think WordPress prioritizes. And that question may sound a bit strange because I'm saying, I'm, I'm say, saying the word WordPress as though it's like a singular organization yeah. or, or a singular body. And really it's not, right? We're talking about this absolutely gigantic um, collection of maintainers and contributors and users and so on. But, but as a project, you know, WordPress does have some core, some core tenants that it, it adheres to. Um, and some of them gear, most of them are geared toward catering to users, right? Like they're the, they're the ones the site is really for at the end of the day. And they're the ones who have to have a good experience. Um, 
more so than developers, right? As much as, yeah. as much as you can, it's great to give them a great experience too. But some, if, if those two are ever at odds, the user should win. So how do you think WordPress has done yep. with that, you know, those role, uh, with the, that job of kind of catering to users while at the same time providing a, a nice, you know, developer experience? Yeah. I mean, WordPress set out to be the platform for publishing, right? And they very much have accomplished that goal uh, and they, you know, continue to improve upon that. Um, I'd say in the, in the early days, uh, user experience and developer experience were kind of synonymous with WordPress. They focused a lot on being able to spin sites up very quickly, whether or not you're a developer. So, you know, there was not, I wouldn't say there was a specific focus early on on developer experience, but many of the users of WordPress were not and still aren't uh, developers, right? And people build sites without writing a line of code sometimes with WordPress. Mm -hmm. So today, I think that the the tides are shifting a little bit, especially in the headless uh, CMS world, where developer experience is getting a lot of focus and uh, and really developer experience leading to a better user experience. Uh, so I think that WordPress, it seems, is still focused primarily on that user and publisher experience, which I think is good. I mean, at the end of the day, the people who use your your site, you know, and use WordPress sites day to day are the publishers. It's not necessarily developers. They build the mm -hmm. site and hand it off for the most part. Yeah. So I think focusing on publisher experience is great. And I think that that's a lot of the WordPress, you know, CMS competitors have spent a lot of time focusing on the developer experience for better or worse, but the publishing experience has lagged behind in, in that area. Yep. Yeah. WordPress was uh, kind of one of the OG no code tools, right? Yeah. To, to use a popular yeah. buzzword these <laughs> days. So it, so it definitely has that um, history to it um, as well. Uh, next, I want to talk about uh, the survey briefly. Um, it was done just recently within the last few months. Uh, Netlify was behind this uh, Jamstack survey um, yeah. where they they just polled uh, members of that the, the greater Jamstack community to see um, what kind of technologies they're using, what kind of technologies they're satisfied with versus dissatisfied with. Um, so for folks listening, you can find that the results of that at jamstack.org slash survey slash 2021. If you want to kind of pull up the, what we're, we'll refer to next year, but uh, we wanted to kind of point out that WordPress um, ranks low uh, in terms of developer satisfaction, but ranks a bit higher when it's used as a headless CMS, um, according to that survey. And yeah. with that, you, know, you, have to, you have to take that a, a, with a grain of salt because this, you know, uh, the survey is being given to fans of this Jamstack, decoupled Jamstack architecture. So it doesn't really come as a surprise that those folks would say they favor a decoupled architecture over um, a traditional one. Uh, but all the same, I think it's the results from this survey are kind of telling. Um, yeah. It, for, in terms of developer satisfaction. So like, do you have any insights into why that would be? Well, why would somebody be like way more geeked about, you know, using WordPress as a headless CMS compared to you know, the technologies involved with using it um, yeah. as a monolith. Uh, a couple of interesting things about that survey um, and, and other surveys have, have kind of uh, confirmed this, but most, and by most, I mean over 50% of new develop, of, you know, of developers right now are, have less than five years experience. And that's a, a crazy statistic that's, you know, because of a lot of boot camps and really just the need for developers has driven a lot of uh, educational content around creating new developers. And it's a very, very much a growing industry. Um, with that said, if you put your mind in that of an, of a, a, someone learning to code and you say, well, what do I want to learn? You go out, you ask questions and and most of the content you get online is about very new cutting edge technology. And that ends up being what people are learning. And that's what they're focused on when they're learning how to code. 
Uh, you know, I personally have created a lot of content for um, a boot camp in the past, and all of the content was around modern, the modern web stack. Um, not a ton of content around, you know, PHP. Not not even a lot of content around .NET or, or some of those technologies. Uh, and so it's it's no surprise to me that um, the technology of choice for a lot of people is is kind of the newer cutting edge technologies. However, uh, WordPress is still up there in sort of the, the top from a usage, usage perspective, which means there are still tons of people building on WordPress. I think the challenge now is that uh, most of the new developers coming in don't have a lot of WordPress experience or PHP experience. And so they are faced with uh, the choice to learn WordPress and PHP or continue moving to the modern stack. And uh, something, another interesting thing from that, uh, the Jamstack survey was uh, headless WordPress in a separate category, right? And I think mm -hmm. that part of that is, um, you know, it's a Jamstack survey, so they want to cover a lot of different bases when it comes to Jamstack-like things. I mean, I I would consider headless WordPress Jamstack, right? So, right. Um, so, but seeing headless WordPress in a category of its own mm -hmm. is interesting. I mean, it's nice to see it's yep. growing a lot faster. It's getting a lot more uh, publicity, and uh, among people who are in the WordPress world and using WordPress, it feels like headless WordPress is addressing the new developers, right? So it's, it's addressing the community of developers that's growing that has under five years experience and is looking to get up and running quickly with sites. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's, it's interesting for me to think about the path of, you know, a new developer coming into the field. Like, um, Will, you've shared with me before that in, uh, the boot, boot camp that, that you ran, as well as many others, they typically start with front end technologies, uh, just because that uh, it makes it very easy for learners to see visually um, the changes that they make, right? So they write a little HTML, reload the page, and now they can see the thing that they just typed being reflected there, right? Likewise with CSS, and then once you sprinkle in some JavaScript to add interactivity, all of that they get the you know quick visual feedback, um, which is great in terms of learning. And generally, server-side languages um, would come later, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so it's interesting to to me to think about somebody you know going through a boot camp right now. Maybe they've they've become uh, competent and skilled at kind of the foundations of the front end, you know, HTML, CSS, JavaScript. Now they're wanting to um, get that full stack component and do some server-side coding so that they could deliver to, you know, the mom and pop shops or the small media business clients, um, a website that has some kind of an admin interface where they can input content themselves and then, you know, pull that, pull that out and render it in the, in the front end, you yeah. know? So, so these folks would, would then would pr probably prompt them to look around, you know, they would probably think, well, I know JavaScript, so maybe I should focus on finding a JavaScript, um, based CMS. So if I want to extend yeah. it, that would be, that would be easy. Uh, but the more they look into it, they might find that even that isn't necessary in some cases. Um, if the CMS does everything you need and gives you JSON output, yeah. right. Then it's like, you don't really, they may not actually care what the underlying technology is. If it's, if it's go, you know, or mm -hmm. Ruby or Ruby or PHP or whatever, as long as it's, um, they can, you know, tweak, tweak things and create their content models and then get JSON out of it. That might be it at the end of the day. So, so WordPress, I think can still headless WordPress anyway, can still fit that, fit that bill. Um, but not traditional, right. Traditional would require. Yeah. I think in the, and, yeah. And in the monolithic, even if you don't dive into PHP, I mean, WordPress still has a front end, right. Even monolithic WordPress, you have a front end, yep, right. uh, that's primarily the JavaScript, jQuery, HTML, CSS, uh, which when you are in a bootcamp, you ultimately do learn those things. Uh, but I'd say you don't spend a lot of time on, um, on you know, CSS and HTML and JavaScript specifically, and, and especially not jQuery. Uh, be and for jQuery's sake, it's because it's, you know, it's starting to um 
become a thing of the past. It's still used incredibly widely, but it's starting to become a thing of the past. And the new, like, sexy things to learn are the uh, the frameworks like Next.js or, um, you know, React and Vue and Nuxt and, and, and all these things that uh, are very new and growing rapidly and addressing a lot of uh, issues on that come up with front-end development uh, and really generally making it easier. So I think that uh, for the newer developers coming in, they they graduate their boot camp with, uh, with those skills, and then that's their comfort zone. And so they're looking for opportunities to improve upon those skills. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And on the podcast before we've, we've asked many of our guests, um, you know, what's their preferred way of building WordPress sites, traditional or, or headless and pros and cons. And, um, you would say, do you think like the headless architecture is the future, you know, is this, could this ever be the way that most new WordPress sites are being built? What do you think? I think so. I mean, and I, I don't know. I don't know for sure, you know, obviously it's all speculation, yeah. but I do think that there is a future where uh, headless WordPress and, you know, headless CMSs in general will become the de facto standard for building sites. I think that there's still a long way to go. I mean, the tooling for a lot of these um, newer technologies is still lacking and you don't get the same experience with headless that you do with traditional or monolithic uh, CMSs, and especially when it comes to WordPress, um, headless WordPress, though it's growing, is still in the very early days, and there's a long way to go to get it to parity with uh, with monolithic WordPress. So, um, mm-hmm. you know, WP Engine is making a huge investment in that area. We have a lot of open source products um, and and some other products that are geared towards headless WordPress specifically, and I think that reflects on uh, WP Engine's understanding that headless WordPress is going to be hugely important in the future. Uh, and and so, you know, when it comes to WordPress or headless WordPress, I think that uh, there are just dis- the decisions you have to make now uh, is, you know, what's the size of my team? Do I have developers? Uh, what's my budget, those kinds of things. In the future, I think that that'll kind of fade away and you will be able to create headless sites no matter your budget or team, right? Mm. So a moment ago, you said um, headless WordPress has a way to go until it reaches parity with traditional WordPress. Yeah. Yeah, and some listeners you know, may, may hear that and think, wait, I thought it was it was the next evolution. It was the new thing. Yeah. And why are we talking about getting to parity with the old thing? Right. So on the, on that note, let's talk a bit about this kind of spicy contentious question. Sure. We we've raised on the podcast a few times, particularly in our episode um, where we talked about the, de- the debate that uh, Matt Mullenweg and Matt Billman had about you know, traditional WordPress versus Jamstack architectures. Um, and I want to get your take on that. Well, you know, in that, just to, just to refresh uh, everyone's memory, who's listening to this um, in a nutshell, you know, Matt uh, Mullenweg, um, the co-founder of WordPress, his argument is that uh, the, that this Jamstack architecture, um, he, he was quoted as saying is, it, it is a regression for the, for the majority of users adopting it. Um, he views it as, you know, multiple, instead of a, a single point of failure, which is your, your, you know, one CMS, now you're breaking things up and having multiple points of yeah. failure. And your site is only as strong as your, you know, weakest uh, link in the chain. Um, it makes things more complex because now you have to have developers who work on the back end and developers who work on the front end. And maybe the front end of app back end code bases are deployed separately and there could be, you know, mismatches between them. There's just complexity added there. Why do any of that? Right, WordPress. Um, you can uh, you can develop a traditional WordPress theme and turn on object caching and full page caching, uh, and use these techniques that folks have used for years to get very you know very fast um, page loads. It's like, what is what's the deal with this uh, Jamstack thing? Why is it compelling enough to to go that route, knowing that 
we still have a ways to go to get it up to parity, as you said, with some of the features that traditional has. Like, what does it bring to the table that makes it worth the, the struggle? Yeah, well, one thing I'll say there is that, uh, you know, WordPress hasn't, tr traditional monolithic WordPress has not solved all of the performance problems that exist. It's not, it, it isn't a fully baked you know, never, you're going to be able to scale at not out to infinity and not have to worry about anything. That's why managed hosting exists. Right. And that's why most right. people who are building high performance WordPress sites are using a managed hosting solution and not trying to go and host their own site. Uh, the same is true of the headless WordPress and headless space in general. There are managed hosting solutions to solve a lot of the scaling issues. And, and what we found is that when you're working with a decoupled or, or headless CMS, uh, those scaling problems are a lot easier to solve. And those are not the issues that I am saying that headless needs to come up to parity with. When I say headless needs sure. to come up to parity, I'm talking about headless WordPress versus traditional WordPress in terms of the uh, some of the developer and publisher experience. So things like installing plugins and, um, and, and being able to use the Gutenberg, uh, editor and eventually full site editing. These are things where WordPress is, is pushing forward with some of this stuff and, uh, headless WordPress is trying to catch up to it. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and I think that over time, those, that you know, will become an even playing field, but where headless yep. WordPress is winning, in my opinion, is in the developer experience. The developer experience of building a headless WordPress site is uh, pretty hard to match with traditional WordPress. Now, I know that there are some, you know, Matt Mullenweg, hardcore WordPress people who will uh, beg to differ on that right. subject, but for me personally, the developer experience in headless WordPress is just vastly vastly better uh for me given that i have so much experience in these technologies that are not php and traditional wordpress right 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 yeah yeah and some folks listening you know they may be, be the wordpress um traditional wordpress purists who like things the way they are and are you know very efficient with that and others may um may argue that php despite being around a long time is a modern language and PH, with PHP eight around the corner, like it's made a lot of advancements. It's gotten a lot faster. Uh, and there are modern, um, you know, there's modern tech like Laravel, you know, uh, yeah. that's still going strong. You know, people, people love it and are rallying around it. So, so just for our listeners out there, like it's not, um, it's not that PHP is, you know, antiquated and is, is going downhill. It's still, still, very, still very widely in, in use, I would say. Uh, as well as WordPress's theme API, but but I, I do agree with you, Will, that it seems like you get more control out of the, the decoupled Jamstack architecture. You get such fine grain control over when data fetching happens and when how rendering happens, which routes are fully static and which aren't. You know that kind of thing is uh, is unrivaled and traditional, and you know from in yeah. my experience. And and to the other point that you brought up about uh, that Matt brought up about Jamstack and how it's like now you have multiple APIs and each one is a point of failure versus WordPress is a single point. I I don't that seems like a non-issue to me. I mean, one thing I'll say just as a general statement is like large software pro, uh, applications have problems that you have to solve. Right? Anytime you have a large software application, whether it's a monolith or uh, a microlith or a bunch of microservices, mm -hmm. you're going to run into problems. Um, and, and I don't think that WordPress, because it's a monolith, uh, has solved every problem in existence and doesn't have an issue with, uh, one piece breaking and taking the site down. I mean, plugins break and take sites down all the time. Very true. Um, <laughs> you know, one line of code can break a site. So it's not like WordPress, monolithic WordPress has solved the problems. Uh, mm -hmm. You still have to deal with them. It's just they appear in different ways, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. And we've heard some arguments on this show of folks saying it's um, it can actually be the case where the decoupled uh, Jamstack architecture ends up being more 
robust. We pointed to our own developers.wpengine.com site as an example of that, where uh, at one point a mistake was made and the WordPress backend was throwing a 500 error, but our Next.js uh, front end, uh, you, you know, when um, its cached versions of those pages had expired and it attempted to refetch that data and was unable to, it just fell back to continuing to serve up that stale data, right? So the end result was anybody visiting our site you know, they would still be able to uh, uh, consume all of our content, albeit, you know, a stale version while we uh, fixed the WordPress backend and got it back up and running. So, so it could be more, um, more robust in some cases uh, yep. as well. But that's, like I said, uh, part of the reason that we were, able, we were fortunate enough to have that experience with the developer site is we were using a managed hosting solution. So we weren't out right. there, you know, trying to do everything ourselves. I totally agree that it is not in your best interest unless you really know what you're doing to go out there and uh, try to, you know, set up everything on your own. Just like if you're trying to spin up a new WordPress site, uh, there are managed hosting solutions that have over the best, the better part of a decade have fixed a lot of scaling issues and, and things with uh, hosting WordPress in general. And so you don't want to just go out there and try to host your own WordPress site, you know, on your laptop or something like that's <laughs> not, that is not a recommended uh, way to go in, in monolithic WordPress. And it's not a recommended way to go in the Jamstack world either. Yeah. Yeah. Which of those approaches do you view as more uh, future proof? You know, I'm thinking about, I can see people arguing this both ways. One way is if I have a WordPress site that's built as a, as a monolith, um, the way WordPress's like theme API works isn't going to you know, radically change over the next few few years. Most likely, right? It'll themes that have worked for years will continue to work for years, and I'll be able to easily you know maintain this this site over time with minimal tweaks and so on. Um, so you could argue that that's you know easier to ma maintain. On the other side of the fence, I could see people arguing that, that well, because um, more of the developers entering the field, you know, who may ultimately end up working on your team because they're focused on these technologies like HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and then they pick up frameworks like, you know, React or Vue or Svelte or so on. If, if your uh, front end is decoupled from your, your back end and it's built using those technologies, you might have an easier time maintaining your site, right? Because you could find this new talent, you could find people interested in working on a Next.js app who might not, yeah. you, know, you may have a harder time finding folks interested in maintaining a traditional WordPress site written PHP. Like, what do you think yeah, about those I think, arguments? I think that uh, there is some truth to that. Um, you know, it's not, I, I don't want to paint WordPress as like COBOL, right? Uh, WordPress has a long way to go and, and, and it's constantly improving and, um, I'm not worried about it, you know, disappearing overnight or anything. So whenever you're starting a software project from a technical perspective, I think that you will experience the same challenges in the future, maintaining a, uh, traditional WordPress site as you will, uh, a headless WordPress site in that you know you will have plugins and and certain dependencies that you rely on that over time they update maybe there is a security hole that gets fixed and you have to update but um it requires you to make some change uh in your either in php if you're in the monolithic wordpress world or or in your front end and and i do think that there are a there's a growing number as proven by this the jamstack survey and, and other surveys out there there's a growing number of new developers with experience in the modern front end stack. And so uh, having, uh, being able to draw from that huge pool of talent to help uh, solve those problems, I think does make it, does indicate to me that uh, in the future, headless WordPress will be more maintainable than traditional WordPress. Interesting. Um, next, I'd love to hear your thoughts on how you think WordPress uh, can stay competitive in the headless CMS space? Um, with my you know ear to the ground, what I've heard folks say is that 
um, modern solutions like Strappy, Sanity, Contentful, Prismic, uh, many of these um, provide a great developer experience, you know, where, where you can hand off uh, sites to your client, where they can, you know, use the content models that you've create, created for them and uh, yep. imp input their data. And then these CMSs take care of exposing that via a REST API or Graph GraphQL schema. And then you can pick your front end technology of choice and, um, and consume that and render it to the page. And it just provides this very nice developer experience. However, it, they, they lag behind WordPress in terms of its editorial workflows, you know, and, and what it brings to the table for publishers. Um, so WordPress, you know, I think is the, has the opposite issue where it's like the editorial workflows and pub and publishing uh, experience is very good, but it, you know it la it lags behind at this moment um, in terms of the developer experience and how easy it is to create those, you know, models and expose them and and consume them and so on. So, what's your opinion? Like, what does what needs to change in the headless WordPress story for it to complete compete with those other modern CMSs that have a great you know, DX in particular. Yeah, I think, um, you know, headless WordPress already has a really good developer experience. Uh, and also there has been some, um, improvement in the developer experience, even in the monolithic WordPress world, for example, you know, building Gutenberg blocks you can do in react and things. And, and I think that that will improve over time. Um, that to me, WordPress is in a in a tricky situation in that uh, they have this really rich uh, publisher experience, which uh, is pretty much unparalleled in these other CMSs. I mean, you know, it's if you've ever tried to tell a uh, a publisher to use Markdown, you know, and try to have that conversation. I've had that conversation many times, and it's it's never good. I mean, they, yeah. they don't leave the conversation thinking, oh yeah, I'll just use Markdown from now on. Um, so those kinds of things are, are problems that other uh, headless CMSs are, are trying to tackle that headless WordPress is already, you know, taking advantage of the publishing experience in WordPress. Um, but I mean, it's totally possible and, and WordPress has shown that it can evolve over time and it can support some more modern tools. And I think that um, it still has the ability to do that in the future for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It seems kind of like a, you could envision it as a race, you know, these modern yeah. headless CMSs that have a great developer experience and, um, the benefit of being uh, a bit more recent, right. They don't have the, the technical debt and the legacy code and so on that WordPress might have. So maybe they can move and iterate faster, and provide a good DX but they're they're rushing to to you know build out the nice editorial workflow and publishing experience, and there's WordPress who has that, but it's rushing to you know make it easy to um, to create content models and expose those and have kind of the DX niceties that these other platforms have. The other thing I'll, I'll say there is uh, WordPress has benefited tremendously by being open source, you know, and being under the GPL license. Um, mm -hmm. You know, whatever you have to say about GPL specifically. WordPress is open source and that's allowed it to grow uh, just way more than it would have if it was closed source from the get-go. So when I look at other CMSs and if I see that they're they're closed source or or really mm -hmm. they cost money, I mean, that's going to be a huge barrier to entry for that CMS to grow. And I don't really necessarily consider it a big, you know, a competitor to uh, to WordPress. That's what I love about Headless yeah. WordPress and and how you can you know, take advantage of this open source tool that has a huge community around it. Uh, and, and now you're integrating some of these modern, other modern open source tools that people like to use. Right. Yep. Yeah. And I guess that's another way to think about it. One way is to, to phrase it as, you know, who's going to, who's going to eat more of the market and it's a race between the CMSs, you know, to compete with one another. But what another way to think of it is, is a, is as a, um, a rising tide lifts all boats kind of situation where yeah. if people move from, from traditional monolith architectures to headless, generally speaking, you know, that, that would mean, um, more users for strappy, sanity, contentful, and so on, but also yeah. for, for, uh, headless WordPress as well. So we may see that all of that, you know, it's not a zero sum game. It could just be as more yeah. folks embrace this, 
this Jamstack buzzword and this decoupled architecture that it turns out all of them have have more users. So it'll be interesting to see. Yeah, and I think that uh, there are a number of old uh, cynics. I feel like I'm I'm kind of in this boat sometimes who are who are like uh, who don't necessarily want to be living in the modern <laughs> front end world and look at it, approach it with a oh man, this is getting so complicated. And there's new stuff coming out all the time. And you know what? For those people, uh, Dreamweaver still exists, and you can still build sites in very old technologies that uh, have made things uh, that are a lot easier nowadays. But if that's what you want to do, you can do it. And it's kind of the same with uh, monolithic WordPress. I mean, if you just want to go back to jQuery and uh, and building sites like that, there is an option for you. You do not have to use the modern stack, but I think supporting the modern stack is absolutely necessary now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. With the size of WordPress, you would never be out of work, right? If you said, yeah. I like, you know, uh, the, the theme API and traditional WordPress themes and running plugins for traditional sites, you have no trouble finding work until the end of your career, most likely, uh, with the quantity yeah. of sites out there that are on it. Um, but for folks who are maybe newer to the tech space and enamored with, you know, JavaScript and front end frameworks and so on, you know, they might be more inclined to, to uh, go the other way, go the headless route. Um, let's end on uh, just predictions for the future. So we'll, you know, we'll miss having you on the podcast here to talk about um, the state of headless WordPress kind of as we experience it. And as we talk, talk to clients and, uh, and make, you know, developer relations content and things like that. Um, but since you're taking off, taking off, uh, tell us what you think, tell us what your predictions are, like how much of the WordPress market do you think, which is about it's somewhere between 40 and 41%, I think, of, of um, websites are on WordPress. What do you think will happen in the next five or 10 years? Like how many of those would, would adopt uh, a headless architecture? Um, what you know, pain points or what advantages would they have from that? What do you think will happen with all of this? Yeah, I think uh, WordPress has established kind of the core um, audience for, for monolith. Uh, or monolithic WordPress in general. Uh, and I think that that is going to exist for a long time uh, and not, and it's probably not going to change within the next five years, maybe even 10 years. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that headless, the headless space is what's growing, growing fast and it's going to continue growing. And, and really my, like the spicy take here is that I don't know that uh, WordPress core has spent a lot of time focusing on headless to this point. I mean, you mentioned uh, Matt Mullenweg and his thoughts on on Jamstack and headless, and right. I that is pretty much it reflects a lot of the uh, ideas that Core has and a lot of what they put into WordPress. And so, I truly think that in the future, headless WordPress is going to reach a critical mass, and maybe other headless CMSs, right? But Headless WordPress will reach a, a critical mass where you cannot ignore it and you cannot deny it and you have to uh, adapt to support it more. And, and I'm excited for that day. I really do feel like that is, that's coming. Um, and I have full confidence that WordPress will adapt to meet those needs. Yep. That'll be interesting to see, certainly. Yep. Uh, well, with that, we'll wrap things up. Uh, I just want to say thank you so much again, Will, for all you've contributed to um, in terms of, you know, blog posts and videos and live, live streams while you've been on the team, as well as uh, to this podcast. So you will be yeah. missed, but uh, best of luck in what comes next and uh, take care of yourself. <laughs> yeah. Like I said, it's been, uh, it's been great. It's bittersweet leaving. I wish I could uh, stay and, and keep working on the podcast. This has been, you know, it's kind of my baby. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, uh, uh, I've really enjoyed doing it. So it's, it's going to be a hole in my life as I move mm. forward. Yeah. Well, we'll soldier on um, without <laughs> you here. Uh, next week, um, we might have a little surprise in terms of a new uh, team member coming on to, to join us on the podcast. So 
We'll be just talking in an echo chamber here. So that will be fantastic. <laughs> so stay tuned for that. With that cliffhanger, uh, we'll, we'll end things. So uh, thank you, Will, for, for all you've done again. And thank you, listeners, for tuning in. Uh, be sure to catch us in the next episode. Until then.